audio yet. There we go. How about now? <laughs> good morning. Welcome. Good afternoon. Good evening. Gosh, wherever you might be, welcome to the live stream today. Today we're here at Channel 9 Studios. You can tell we're in Channel 9 Studios, even though I've green screened it all out. Because right. I'm here with my friend Javier. Hey, everybody. How's it going? And uh, we want to talk a little bit about realworldasp.net today. That's correct. Yes. So today, let me make sure I do the rest of the intro. It is September 11th, 2018. Um, we're going to write a lot of code today. Folks are already seeing a little bit of your screen here in the corner, mm -hmm. but uh, I think we're going to have some fun because you've been writing a lot of ASP.NET Core for the past week or two, getting us ready for the big event this week, .NET Conf. That is correct, yeah. So we, uh, let me share my screen here. Oh, it is. So I already brought it up. Boom. Uh, so yeah, tomorrow, actually, tomorrow, uh, September 12th, the 13th and 14th, we'll be live streaming from Channel 9 Studios here in Redmond, Washington. Uh, tons of sessions. Uh, 42 sessions. 42 sessions in total. The craziest thing about this year with .NET Conf is that we are doing, it's technically not 24 hours because the you know, it's pedantic in me is just like, nah, it's more than 20 because we're going from 8 a.m. on Thursday morning, that is September 13th. But 8 a.m. Pacific time. Pacific time, sorry. Yes. 8 a.m. Pacific time. Yes. September 13th, all the way to 5 p.m. September 14th. So that is over 24 hours of .NET sessions for you to tune in. So if you are watching us from across the globe and saying, hey, that's too early or that's in the middle of the night for me or whatever, don't worry. We're going to have a session right in your time slot so you can wake up. Look and uh, watch some, some .NET and get some learning on. Yeah. Now, the folks are saying that it is a little bit quiet. I'm going to try and bump that oh. soundboard just a little bit further. No problem. Go ahead. Keep an eye on the gauge yeah. there for me. We've been having fun with the sound um, since these are not uh, Jeff's microphones. These are the studio's microphones. And the setup here at Channel 9 is ridiculous. Some of the stuff that they have here is crazy they have cameras we get this crazy Canon camera that's looking at us right now 4k camera that can move around it's pretty crazy. Yeah, oh yeah there we go is but that a little bit better I'm yeah. seeing us in the yellow but room. I will say that uh, give me one second they do actually do run the hottest technologies the, here oh my gosh Nine. something like this we have a little bit of Windows me <laughs> to, to power your life yeah so if yeah, this this is the kind of stuff. Hot, what more do you need? That we have here at Channel Nine. That's what you need in order to run a, a stream effectively. Yes, the green screen is a little bit off because the lighting in this room is um, it's optimized actually to have the real background behind us, the the bookshelves and things. But mm -hmm. I think the green screen is a little bit better. And when we drop out and we go to the full screen here, I think it looks a little bit better there. Yep. So, uh, but sounds better, good. All right, and I'm not gonna play any background music today because we're gonna be talking a lot. That is right. So I actually had somebody complain about the background music that I normally play. That, oh my good. gosh, I can't pay attention, I can't, I, you know, it's so distracting, it's disturbing to me. I'm like, I've done 135 shows. <laughs> You're the first person to complain. Hey, one, I don't know. one out of 135 is not bad. That's not I bad, that, I guess. yeah. <laughs> All right, so we're getting ready for .NET Conf. Yes. And we've done a number of things to optimize websites and get th get stuff up and running. And you were talking to me a little bit about output caching this morning. Oh, gosh, yes. So um, so here's the fun part about it. Imagine all oh, 10,000 of your closest friends hitting your website pretty much all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Just because reasons, right? Reasons. Uh, so... The, the thing that we've been trying to do, we've been trying to yeah, leverage as much as we can in Azure and, and ASP. So it's funny because uh, we're trying to use Azure and we're using ASP.NET Core and um, ASP.NET proper or framework, right? Okay. Full framework. So you're, you're, you're crossing the streams here using all the ASP Nets. All the ASP Nets. And the reason why we're doing that is because long ago, like two years ago, we wrote the entire main site, the one you see here, in .NET, in ASP.NET. That one. This one. Probably. Tell you what, let's, we can actually do this. There Perfect. we go. Perfect, yeah. So this one. <laughs> um, right there. And so as we try to, we, we give it, we've given this outside just a couple of, um, just facelifts, you know, changing the UI here, you know, doing some uh, font changing and so forth. But the system behind the scenes runs as fast as we can make it, given that it's just a it's a simple, simple little website. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, so one of the things we wanted to do this this time is sort of migrate it to .NET, uh, .NET Core, but we just ran out of time. Sure. So that's in the to-do after the conference. 
but, but to, we will get there. But but to right a, a point that you hear a lot of folks at Microsoft say for the past you know since we released ASP.NET yes. Core is you don't need to migrate to ASP.NET Core. Correct. You know, take your time. Get yes, there when exactly. it makes sense for you. Exactly. And, and the reason why we we didn't migrate right away is for for many reasons, but the most important one is that the site works. <laughs> yes. Right. Yes. The site works and it works really well. Uh, little little known fact behind the scenes, uh, the database that powers, uh, for example, the agenda. It's a scroll down, you see day one and so forth, you know, agenda for days. <laughs> Click on the speakers, you see the, uh, the speaker information loading up. All of this is powered by a really, really high throughput database called a CSV file. <laughs> Wait, hang on. A CSV file, a, CSV a, a comma-separated values. Yes. Literally, it's a block of text you're using to present that content. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> Come on now. And, uh, so a little bit behind the scenes, why we chose a CSV file is that we've tried all the files. Yeah. <laughs> like literally, we tried XML one year. Yeah. We tried YAML one year. Okay. We did a SQL database one year. Yeah. Uh, everything. Oh, okay. Right? Now, why didn't the SQL database work? So the, the reason why the SQL database didn't, it's not that it didn't work, it worked okay. well, but now I have to, to be able to edit the data mass, uh, uh, to make it, Edit the database in? Inside for whatever thing that we did, we completely forgot to write functionality on top of, which you tend to do when you're trying to slap in these things together. Uh, oh my gosh, now I gotta have SSMS so I can Open up, pop up on ports. I can go okay. to database, blah blah blah. There's so many different Wait, moving parts. Hang on, you, you you ran by SSMS. Yeah, so SQL Server Management Studio. Okay, right. So yeah, so you have to have a tool like that, or any other um, uh, any other uh, SQL uh, tool that allows you to connect to SQL Server to connect to it and be able to say, hey, update this record, and not have to use SQL to do that. Not saying that that's a bad thing. It's just that there's so many other plates spinning. That is, that is one less plate that will spin. Sure. You have to worry okay. about. So the reason why we chose a CSV file is because if you think about it, the data doesn't really change that much. right? Once no. we set the data, it's set. But once we pick the speakers, they're set. The, the only thing we might change might be like your title or your Twitter handle. Or maybe we change the abstract a little bit before because the speaker says, you know what, I'm not going to be able to do this demo exactly. or this feature. Okay, I get it. So. Yeah, so, so there's not a lot of churn that needs to be something that is high scalable, you know, or data replicated across the globe. We don't need any of that. It's just literally three files <laughs> that we sure. need okay. to be able to um, operate it. And then, and then I'm thinking out loud, mm -hmm. right? Uh, your machine. Oh, sorry about that. Um, thinking Falls out loud asleep. then, our, um, our database, we can edit on GitHub, we can commit changes to GitHub, and then pull request gets fired, uh, not a pull request, deployment gets fired because yeah. a file change, exactly. and everything's updated. Boom, yep. Okay, Yep. so right, this is a good study in simple, gets the job done, Yeah. and it's as effective as we need it to be. It is, and, and, and the reason, so it's funny, because you may, you may uh, as a developer, I'm like, Oh, but is it web scale? Is it all this different things? Like, well, we did the best that we could after many years of doing this conference. So right. this is, I think, our fifth year doing yeah. the conference. Just doing .NET Conf. We've done other conferences before. We've done NBC Conf, we've done XP Conf. So technically, I think it's been like close to like nine or ten years okay. since we've been okay. doing these conferences. So we've learned every year something that, hey, you know, that makes it better, that doesn't make it better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when we reach this point, we're like, hey, you know what? Simple, it's better. Okay. So even though we have the CSV file, like we were uh, discussing, like you said, we do a change in the CSV file, we get push and straight into GitHub, get that GitHub repository is connected with Azure. Azure then just picks it up and says, oh, got it, just let me compile this. Oh, it's super simple, boom, bam, here we go, we're live. Right. So when these files get updated, and like say we change your title from, um, from web guy from to web program guy manager. To program manager, okay. right? We go that way. And we push it out there. The file gets when because we're deploying it, everything that we have out there is cached. So okay. It gets dropped because of the deployment. Right. So when someone hits the page, we go and read the file, cache it for I think for, I think it's twelve or fourteen hours. I don't remember. Because it's not going to change. It's not going to change at all. Right. 
right? So we only have the disk hit that one time, right in the cache, and we're just pumping out so, of memory. So you load the CSV into memory because it's, it's yeah. what, 60 lines, 80 lines? At most. Yeah. At most. Mm -hmm. So you're not, you're not taking up that developers, much memory. Okay. You know, a couple hundred K. Developers, 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 developers. And then you're just querying through that and presenting it and then output caching on top. Yeah. Okay. Well, we haven't turned that on yet because okay. the reason why we haven't is because we've been making some tweaks. <laughs> okay. So the last thing we want to do is able to add output caching as we're changing things and be like, why doesn't it work? Okay. Oh, yeah, because let me go and validate the cache. and then It's just an extra step, right? Okay. So once we're reaching today, we're going to say, hey, everything looks the way we want it. Let's turn output caching. So now we have layers of caching. Okay. So okay. that way you, as a, as, a, uh, um, as a client, as a consumer of the website, you can just boom, 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 see the information and don't have to worry about loading and everything else. I was doing some load testing this morning. I was talking to you. Yeah, there's nothing more fun than doing stress testing on a website at 6 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> wake up. Or, wake up in the morning, have a nice right. cup of Good Morning yeah. America, and stress test your website. <laughs> that's right. So I'm sitting there like, hey, you know, let me run a thousand concurrent users. Wait, okay. wait, a thousand? A thousand. Oh, my. Okay, go ahead. That's right. And then it's like, hey, you know what? We're getting some pretty good performance. Now let me bump that up to 3,000. Okay. Then 5,000. Yeah. And then 10,000. Nice. Do it! Go further. Yeah. So... Well, the maximum I can go is 10,000 because, oh, okay. because, because that's the free tier. <laughs> that's the okay. top of the free tier now, that I'm doing uh, on testing. Now, Shadow, Boxer asks, uh, yeah. Shadow Brokering asks, yeah. why not JSON? Why CSV and why not JSON? Oh, that's a great question. All the cool kids love the curly All braces. All the cool kids love the curly braces. Well, uh, honestly, the reason why we went with this way is because it's, uh, it's all about process. Okay. So just think of it this way. The data that I need to put into JSON, I have to pull it from somewhere. Right. Right. What we are doing right now, uh, actually, our, a good example is our call for papers was a uh, OneDrive Excel spreadsheet that people went and fill out the information. Gotcha. Yes. So you see where I'm going so, with this. So <laughs> we've got we've got marketing people. We've got we've got our content folks that yes. are managing a document in Excel. Why convert it back to JSON? It's work. It's, right. it's extra work that I have to do outside of all the other things that have to be done with the conference. So I can just take that Excel document and actually give them the Excel documents and say, hey, as you go and talk to um, the 60-something well, speakers that we have, uh, go and fill out here three columns. For, uh, for columns, first name, last name, title, Twitter, blah. Done. Yeah. They go on and fill it out. Boom, here's a spreadsheet. They update this one drive. I literally go save as CSV, load it, and, boom. And everybody Works. knows how to do save as CSV. We don't have to retrain folks on how to go and put Correct. stuff into the right format. Save as CSV, and it's just it works. standard. Yeah. Now, could have we written a pretty interface for someone to go on the web and edit that? Yes, we could have. But that takes time away from other stuff that we need to focus on. So, okay, so, and, and what you're describing then is this great balance that I think we as developers sometimes struggle with. Oh, gosh, yeah. Where we, I do it too. <laughs> where we, right, we want to have, right, the perfect interface. We want, we, we perfect is the enemy of good enough, right? <laughs> yes, it is. It is, yep. Right, so it's good enough for us to just save an Excel file because it's only going to be read and cached once a day yes. at the most. It, 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 yes. <laughs> But, right, it, we, if we want it perfect. It'd be great to have a user interface so I could maintain this stuff online, save it back to the database. Don't need it because this is, this is a one-time thing. And after the event's over, it's not going to see anywhere near as much web traffic. Correct. Yep. So it's a, it's a set it and forget it. And then minim, it's minimal spinning up, minimal spinning down. I mean, it's a good example of this. One of the things that I did... Uh, last year at the end of the other conference was playing a little more with the cloud, right? So I uh, obviously am an ASP.NET guy, been mm -hmm. for many, many, many years. So I thought, it's like, hey, how can we, you know, now that we have this deployable package, right? So we got the website with the three files that everything is run out of. Yep. Let's push that out there. You know, you think about it, I can put that all over the data centers oh, and yeah. across the globe. Mm -hmm. So I can literally mm -hmm. Azure all the things by just taking this thing pushing it out to everything. I don't have to worry about data replication because it's, it's, a, just CSV. it's a CSV file. Right. Everything's there. Then I can, okay. put in like okay. the, I can put a traffic manager in there. So the traffic manager, everybody goes to the traffic manager and the traffic manager says, hey, 
Let's do this. Then. Let's let's send you to the region that's closest yes. to you. So you're in the States, you're on the East Coast, we'll send you to East US. Correct. You're in Europe, we're going to send you to Central Europe. Correct. Awesome. Yep. Okay. So, and, and it worked wonderfully. Now, the thing about it, though, for something like that, is that if I make a change, now I have to update 12 things, you know, or, or depending as many data centers I went to. Not necessarily that's bad, it's just a lot of churn for what we had. So okay. we can, I kind of backed away from it, even though that is an op, that's a way of doing it, because now I have, essentially, there's, say there's 12 data centers that I deploy this to, now I have 12 different apps. Sure. That I have to deploy. Sure. And, right, but, but that's why we want to set up automated continuous deployment, so Correct. that when you did that, yes. that push into the GitHub repository. It will just push them out there. But, but it takes, it doesn't do it all at once, there's a rolling. So, which uh. is the way you want things to do. Uh, but I just didn't want that extra churn for the moment. Just to make sure, in case some of our yes. some of our beginner uh, developers watching aren't familiar, why would you want to roll oh, that's a great that question. stagger yep. to different data centers? So you want to roll it out. So uh, basic, actually, just testing, making sure that what you did and the process is working. So uh, say, for example, out of these twelve data centers, I can say, hey, let me try one, and does it all come up the way we expect it to? Great. Now do the other one. Great. Now do the other one. So sure. instead of saying, hey, here's the entire website and nothing works because we forgot a to close JSON file <laughs> format or anything yes. else, yes. which I know we the missed. reasons why we did not choose <laughs> JSON. We missed a curly brace. <laughs> we missed a curly brace or there's something there, right? Uh, so that's why if it's good to kind of do a rolling deployment to know that, hey, we know this works. Okay, sure. now the next one. And now the next one. Sure. They, not just... Right, we know it works, but there's also uptime, oh, right? Gosh, yep. So you might be in the East US, and East US data centers being updated. Well, while you're requesting stuff, it'll bounce you over to West US. Correct. Nice. Yeah, that's the beautiful right? thing about the traffic manager. There's there's zero configuration you have to do or writing your code to do it. You can say, hey, traffic manager, here are the endpoints that I want you to do. It is the closest one. Uh, pick the closest one to me. That's the, the, essentially the, uh, the setting that we used. Again, for this test, we're yeah, not using yeah, yeah. that now. Uh, but we can say, okay, well, here's the way it's set up. If I, if something is up with the uh, East US data center, it could be something with the actual data center itself or the application. There's, there's an un, There's Exactly. There's an unresponsiveness that, that's there, planned yeah. or unplanned. Uh, it will say, oh, let me take you to the next closest data center that I have configured without you knowing that writing if statements or something on your code to go and try everything else. Right, and that's the advantage of platform as a service. Correct. So, and, and right, to be fair, right, equal opportunity here, all, all of the clouds, not just Azure, oh, gotcha. offer, all the similar, clouds. All the clouds offer similar functionality. Yep. They call it different things. We call it traffic we, manager. We, we like Azure here, <laughs> and we call it traffic manager. Yep. And the nice thing about also, so it is a thing to uh, keep praising uh, traffic manager, you can also load balance non-Azure resources. So for okay. example, say if uh, you use uh, Rackspace for your, for your okay. hosting application and sure. you want to post in two different spots, you can actually set up Traffic Manager as your load balancer in Azure and then load balance across your Rackspace instances because it's just a URL that it's load, load balancing against. That's pretty cool. Yes. All right. So, so that's a little bit about output caching and some of that architecture yep. stuff. Now, I was hoping that you could help us with a little pull request review today sure. and take a look at some of the functionality that we're building around, around CoreWiki. I know some, we've got some folks in the chat room that have made some contributions. And CoreWiki is this project we've been working on now since March, okay. building a, a simple CMS, a, a wiki, mm -hmm. with ASP.NET Core. And we're trying to learn as we go along. And some folks have submitted some pull requests that sure. we have out there. Can we take a look? Yeah, let's take a look. All right, right so yeah. let's run over to github.com. Okay, we'll she'll do that here. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit because my eyes are old. And uh, <laughs> so I can look here. <laughs> we're, not, we're not that bad. So we've got four pull requests <laughs> sitting out there. Um, the first one right here is... We're actually going to, I think we're going to talk about that bottom one, number 280, with our friend uh, Kathleen Dollard on Thursday. Oh, nice. So, yeah, I so introducing StyleCop for keeping, looks like there's been a healthy conversation around this. Yeah, there has been. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, 
We'll come back to Very this nice. one because I think Kathleen's got some interesting insight that we'll come back to and we'll discuss around this one. Excellent. Um, and and she's got some very good points. I we were talking to her last night about it, mm -hmm. and uh, I think you might. I, I think Chris Jones actually might be very happy to hear Kathleen's insight on that. Awesome. Um, what do you think about number two ninety there? The feature, oh. the deploy to Azure button. Yes, let's take a look at that one. So this is from our friend uh, Frank, and we we started we introduced um, we we talked to I got a I got a phone call from. <laughs> And he said, uh, wouldn't it be cool if you had a Deploy to Azure button for CoreWiki? And uh, we started working on that uh, a few days ago. We ran into some problems around the Deploy. And uh, I backed off. And our friend Frank here took a look at the problems that we were having. And he put together some updates to make Deploy to Azure work. Oh, excellent. So you want to take a look at this? Sure, let's take a wanna, look at Want to break yeah. this open? Yeah. So. Uh, Core Wiki is a bunch of different projects, and what it looks like Frank did here was he added a dot deployment file. Yep. Right. So I understand that dot deployment tells Azure how to deploy a project. Yes. Okay. So we should take a look at what that is. He mm -hmm. created a file called deploy.cmd, mm -hmm. and he updated our Cake build script mm -hmm. to keep Kudu up to. Uh, in sync. What, what's Kudu? So Kudu is an actually an open source project okay. that was started by Microsoft to allow you to do sort of the back end scenes for an application. You can um, Kudu is the engine per se that runs app services. Oh. So when we're talking about um, hey Git push into GitHub, yeah, and yeah. magic happens, yeah. and then it's on Azure. Sure. The magic is Kudu. Okay, okay. So it syncs with GitHub. There's actually, uh, behind the scenes, there's actually a private Git repository that it's syncing with. Okay. So that's where I actually so there's a request. <clears throat> there's a private Git repository somewhere on Azure yes. that it's pulling my GitHub changes into. It's syncing it. Okay, it's syncing it, mm -hmm. and, when it see, and when that sync completes, that's what it's deploying Correct. from. Yep, it syncs it. Okay. It says, hey, now I've... I do a pull request. Sorry, not pull request. I did a git pull latest from based on the on the uh, webhook that yeah, um, yeah, yeah. that GitHub sent. It says, "All oh, right, well now let me go, you know, get update master. My copy of master the next one. The moment it updates, and it says, okay, now I got to go run a build.' Okay, and a, a Kudu handles all that. It, just to make sure folks know yes. what it is, a webhook is right. It's that notification that it's that little. It's a little nudge a little that nudge. the web service that your whatever web service, and I mean not like if anything it could be GitHub, it could be uh, Gmail, whatever. Sure. It's a service that it's essentially just says, "Hey, by the way, here's a post. Here's a thing happened. X, an event happened. Okay. It's a poor man's event. <laughs> it's it, right. It, it's a uh, it, it's event driven. Yes. Right, but disconnected across HTTP. Yep. And the reason why okay. I say that is because. Like if you think an event, you think CQRS, which I, I think yes. you're, you're doing, you're doing some oh, of that. Yeah. There is actually some state around it where the webhook is just more like here. Yeah, this That's thing it. happened. This happened. Good luck. Mm -hmm. Right. You were listening for this. Do something with it exactly. if you want to. Exactly. Okay. So uh, let's take a look at what's in this Perfect. in this deployment so, file and then the deploy command. All right. So, so one of the things we can do in here, straight on the pull request, we can just go to the files change. Yeah. And so we can look at. So add the different files here. Since it says there's only three files, let's look at it. Okay, well, it looks like this is pretty easy. Pretty oh, my easy. gosh, yes. So we're just going to call deploy.command. Deploy.command, all right. Makes sense. So let's see what deploy.command does. Do we have deploy.command somewhere? Actually, so I, th I, mm, I think he renamed it to deploy to Azure. Oh, dot deploy command. To, if you command scroll down, down the bottom. Perfect. Yeah, That's fine. yeah. And, I, and so consequently... That dot deployment file needs to be updated also. Yes, so it's gonna so, not work. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So all right. This is why we do pull requests, people. <laughs> well, this <laughs> so is why we do we, code review. Yes. Right. <laughs> so we can. So those two are are out of sync. That should be easy to to clean up here. Correct. Yep. Um, okay. So if not exist tools, make directory make tools. tools. Yep. Okay. If not exist tools, add in to make the directory adding. Then we do. Uh, then we getting the the specific version of Cake. Right. From NuGet. Uh, and then we're saying, hey, you're going to save it to the tools directory. 
And then once it, NuGet goes through and sets it up, it says, okay, now let's actually run cake with kudu deploy that cake uh, for this specific target. Okay. So uh, let's see now what the kudu that uh, kudu deploy that cake file does, which is, is right here. This These file. Are, yep. So we know that hey, here's the the package version that we have. It's interesting that we have point eight. Uh, eight, and we have point three in the other one. I think so. It's depending on the cake dot kudu package. Oh, my apologies. Yeah, not, yeah. not cake itself. Right, it's cake um, zero point three. Yes, but cake kudu. Okay. So Jay that, and Jay Wood is suggesting we need that new PR review extension for VS Code. Yeah, yeah that's that's pretty nice. They they released a new extension for oh, Visual really? Studio Code that helps you with pull request reviews, yeah. but. A lot of folks are in GitHub. Let's stay yeah. here. And it's, so here's the funny thing about you know that uh, the extension. I love um, uh, VS Code extensions, but sometimes I'm on the go, like I working okay. with clients and so forth. So yeah, yeah. Some of them, even with uh, I have clients that work on uh, VST, uh, sorry, formerly VSTS, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Visual Studio Team Systems. Yeah, they now, just renamed now it. Azure DevOps. Yes. Um, and GitHub or Bitbucket or mm -hmm. any other thing out there. That more often than not, I am looking at pull requests. Yeah. Via this fancy device called an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> so it's easier for me to just kind of like, hey, it webs, you know, scales it differently, kind of da 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 da, and sometimes even approve them depending how big they are. Yeah. So to be able to do it from your phone is a heck exactly. of a Exactly. So this is why, you know, like you're talking about extensions. Extensions are great if you're always there, but if, you, if you're not there, then, you know, using something like this is also good. Now, um, Binary Logics, actually, he, look at this, what Binary Logic picked up. The name of the cake file is deploy to azure.cake, and the command file was referring to kudu deploy.cake. Ooh, so, so we got issues all over the place. Well, not issues. Well, no, yeah. issues. Well, what I mean by that is like we just naming things. Yeah, right. right. I mean, we which happens to all of us. I mean, that's yes, just, we've yeah. got to get this lined up. So, uh, yes, points for binary logics for picking that up. Cool. Yeah. Um, and I'm noticing that my my images there in the corner are out of date. That's okay. <laughs> so it's referring to events that I've already been to. I'm like, oh, I, I was already there. Uh, all right, so so this is the new deploy file. So let's see, we're doing, uh, if we are running on Kudu, that's yep. interesting, running on Kudu, okay. Yep. Um, because we want to be able to know that if we can execute those Kudu commands. Right? Okay. If someone can run this file anyway. You could run it locally. Well, you could run it locally. Okay. So you want to make sure that you actually do it, only execute this if you're the environment. If you're on Which Azure, on sense. Kudu, okay. Which also then means this won't run when you're inside of a Docker container because that's not Kudu either. Correct. And actually, okay. if you think about it, a doc, the way you would deploy this in a docking container should be significantly different than the way you would deploy it on Azure. Sure. Unless you're deploying this in a Docker container in Azure, then it should be the same. Right. And we have a different cake file that does do right. Docker build. Yeah. Okay. So um, if we are on Kudu, then it's going to get the deployment path is the Kudu deployment target. I think that makes sense, yep. right? Yep, it does. Uh, oh, sorry, if that directory there. doesn't exist, throw a directory not found exception. Yep. Okay. And then task is kudu sync is de dependent on publish, publish. Yep. which comes out of our other build cake file that you see right. down so there at the bottom. only deploy if publish has been executed. Or okay. actually only execute if, if, if publish has been published. Well, run publish first before you run kudu sync. Right, which typically that's okay. the way any, any make, any, um, make or build uh, system does it, they say, hey, what are my dependencies? And it all just runs it in that order. Okay. Granted, it, you can always say run X, but. Okay. So if we're going to merge this, mm -hmm. I, a part of me wants to pull this down, touch up those, those couple of file names in these files mm -hmm. so that they're pointing to the right location. Correct. And then push it back up and do the merge. Correct. Okay. Um, is that something that that you can do or, or you will have to do that because I am just looking at because I'm not uh, I the repo. you're not you're not cool I am not I do not uh, have I permissions see how this repo, works. which actually is a good thing <laughs> <laughs> all right so here's what I'm going to do yep. I'm I'm going to pull a copy of this locally yep um, so I'm going to go over to my dev branch. I'm not. I know I'm not showing this. Nope. So uh, as you're doing this, I'll, I'll narrate for I'm doing. So he's, he's and then I'm going to set up a live yep. share. So right now he's in um, Bash, saying, "Hey, go check out to the dev branch." 
updating it, resetting what he had in there, just because he was just playing around. Yeah. Uh, just he just pulled down, uh, get it, did a git pull. Um, get and updated. Merging all the changes, so now he should have everything that he has locally. Right. So now I'm going to get a copy of this locally, and then I will turn on live share so we can take a look at this together. Uh, da, 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 da. It is this one, that. And I will I want it paste. It's not going to paste for me. It feels bad now. You have to go paste it with actual Mac. I know, right? That's oh, it didn't. Oh, it's because the JavaScript failed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice. And I forgot. You forgot. I the, forgot the G. The G. Dude, dude. Ooh, it actually did something. Uh, uh, no, no, no. It pulled into the wrong branch. Oh. Not good. Uh, if I do a reset hard, it's not going to do it. Uh, yeah, when you do a uh, reset hard, remember, it's only doing it locally. Yeah, so. I need to check out Orange and Dev. And then make sure I have everything. Yep. Okay, now I'm in Frank's branch. All right, now yep. I can go over and let's set up live share so we can take a look at this. Mm -hmm. So I am going to open CoreWiki on my machine mm -hmm. and then I'm going to do a live share so that folks can see on your machine and we can fix this together. Yep, no problem. Let me close these editors. So Javier's on a Mac mm -hmm. with Visual Studio Code. Pretty uh, oh, Apple logo. <laughs> yeah, look at this. Windows, uh, Windows, Windows Lenovo, Lenovo Mac. Mac. Right, we are equal opportunity offenders here. That's right. Funny enough, uh, I've been using Mac since I don't know 2011. Yeah. And um, Windows now for me just it's a virtual machine. So I have uh, VMware Fusion. Some people use Parallels or something else. I, okay. I like, I like VMware Fusion because. I can take that same uh, VM and run it on Windows. Okay. And it seamlessly worked that way. But all of my Windows development for .NET, it's actually in a virtual machine. Gotcha. <laughs> Running on a Mac. Oh, Frank is here and asking, hey, would you Frank. like me to fix this? You know what? We're just going to take care of it real quick yeah. here. It's we, we want it. It's not necessarily that, you know, hey, this is an error. Like, we want to do something also on our side. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. So I, um, Otherwise, it's going to be a long show of really bad jokes. There are no bad jokes here. We have amazing jokes here. They are the bestest jokes. The best. <laughs> there is nothing like it. Here comes the Perfect. link for you. Thank you, sir. There you go. All right. All right. So what do we got here? No worries, Frank. It's this is easy to clean up. Uh, what's Brave Cobra mm -hmm. saying here? Don't tempt you. Is there something running Linux? Uh, no, I don't have anything running Linux here today. Um, uh, Mr. Tethys says, is dependent on is that dependent on other tasks? Yes. So you set up tasks and then you tell it is dependent on different yeah. things here, and it will. Uh, sign so sign in with your Microsoft account. Oh, I mean, I can sign with GitHub too. That works too. Um, but by making those dependent on each other, it effectively creates a dependency chain, and whatever is least dependent gets executed first, all the way down to the uh, through the chain of things, the tasks. Uh, you have failed the live stream. No, no, no. Uh, it's not live stream. It's live stream, live coding stream. There are a few streamers out there that really do seem like a live stream. Live stream. <laughs> Uh, Unless coding is live. It is. It's very live. Hey, so mind. you're connected to my machine. Correct. And actually, if, if, let me see, if you, it doesn't, is it showing? Yeah, I can see. Visual Studio Live Share. Right? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So yeah, no, we want to go check out up at, I don't have. It's a little bit bigger so people can see. In it. the build items up top here, I need to add the existing items that Frank just created on desk oh, for us. It. Yep. And then they'll appear on your machine. Right, so these are the two deploy to Azure and the dot deployment file. Okay. Now this will make them part of the solution. And if I save my solution file, 
you should have a solution items. There you go. Now you can see right that there was dot deployment and you oh, can sorry see. About that. Yeah, yeah, there you go. And oh, yeah, there it is. Right, deploy to Azure yep. Cake, deploy I to see. Azure I'm sorry. Command. I'm scrolling too fast. How to <laughs> how to make an entrance. Yes. How to make an entrance. I'm just gonna <laughs> Hi, I'm Jeff. Um, <laughs> so we need to change we needed to update the dot deployment file to point to the renamed deploy to Azure command. Yes. So if you, if you open this guy, and that needs to point to instead of kudu deploy cake on line four, yep, it needs to be deploy to Azure that cake. Right. I'm going to change the dot deployment file to to point to deploy to Azure oh, perfect. Yes. dot command. So I'm going to and then I'm going to jump over to your file where you are yep. and just park up here. So folks can see, there's where my cursor is. Yep, there's Jeff. I can see you right here. All pretty. Oh, yeah. So deploy to, to Azure. Azure. Yeah. We're able to rename things. That That's what amazing developers we are. <laughs> if I had a mic, I would drop it. <laughs> these are expensive mics. <laughs> these are expensive mics. Don't drop those. Yeah, people at Microsoft will get mad at me if I, if I drop these ones. Yes. <laughs> Don't do that. There we go. <laughs> um, var entrance equals new entrance. Yes. Uh, Mr. Tethys says, Live share is so good, there's audio extensions for it, too, if you don't like Skype, Slack, phones, etc. Yes. The trick, though, is you still need to get that initial connection, and that's why the, the hookup with Slack is kind of cool, because people, lots of folks have Slack. Yeah. Well, that's why we use Skype, because it, actually before the show, we were like, how are we going to share this <coughs> link? I'm like, you, yeah. you want to text it to me? And it was like, eh. We can because he's on Windows, right? If he was, if he had a Mac and he can use Messages app, I can pick yes. it up over here, see it. So, but yeah, whether it's Skype, whether it be Teams or yes. whatever, it just works. So, all right. So you save the file. That comes back over to my machine. The deploy to Azure. So that's the command file, the deployment file. I yep. and the cake file d didn't change at all. No, the cake need was mm, delicious. Piece of piece of cake. Cake. All right, so now we'll be here all week, folks. Yes, we literally Please. will be here all week, <laughs> in, including at crazy times at night. Well, we'll talk about it a little bit later. But uh, I sure. Think we, I think that that deserves its own like five minutes of just explaining. Yes, it the does. Awesomeness that's gonna happen. Oh my gosh! So the the overnight shift for sleep, .net. Geek sleep over. Geek sleep over. Kinda. <laughs> All right, so I am going to do the merge now. This should make everything happen. Mm -hmm. and everything looks good. Here it goes, resolving deltas, pushing. Okay, and I've got a, why do I have a tilde three here? We didn't, I didn't commit you, these files. You did an atom, yep, so get add dash a. Because YOLO. No, capital no, no. A. Git add dot. Add. Git commit. Uh, uh, fixed naming change. How many of you guys that do out there do git add dash capital A? Just let me know via the chat. So what the, hang on. What does git add dash capital A do? So git add dash capital A does. It says, hey, whatever files I have here that I deleted, that I modified, or added new, just add them all in. Okay, so I do I do git add period, and it does the same thing. It's just a different syntax. Okay. The git dash dash a is the, the way you you do it in the past. Okay. So git add dash a capital a capital a. Okay. And since and you're in batch, so it's all. Yeah. So essentially, any anything that has been modified in the working directory, I want to take that as the truth. Okay. Yeah. And, and and which the reason why I say you do that is because if you make, if you are I would say, uh, making your changes as small as possible, only touching the files that you need to touch, and you're not like me, you squirrel and you wander down this other path. I'm like, oh, let me go change, let me update all the nougat packages. Yes. Right, and then boof. Distraction. Do Don't do that. Yes. <laughs> make the changes small so that we know. Hey, I've changed these three files. Get dash a. Bo uh, add dash a, bam, everything's there. Okay. So what do you say we test our deploy to Azure? Yeah, let's, let's check it out. Okay. So let me, bring, let me come back. And and I, I like what Janescu is suggesting as well. Um, we do have a production space for 
for core wiki that we should update. Um, we'll come back to that. So if we go back to oh, the Oh, you already merged it. Ooh, yes, I merged it. hardcore. I, well, it's interesting that because I did the commit. No, I, it's interesting that it doesn't show you the updated files. Uh, well, no, it doesn't show it because I did. I, mer I merged it before. Oh, before you <laughs> before pushed, I committed. Before you pushed it, got Oops. it. So you automatically just went boom, which is fine. I'm just, yeah. So now if we go back to the code page, right? Oh, sorry. Here. Yep, we should see it. Deploy to Azure button. It's down there somewhere. There it should be. All right. So let's give it a shot. And then we can update the README also. Okay. I'm going to touch it. Uh, what? what? You don't trust I'm not, us? I'm not trusted. Frank put it's all just this like wonderful work We're in. live coding and people are looking at us. I'm like, you never know what's going to happen. Oh, I know what's going to happen. It's going to deploy. All right. So now it's going to prompt you for all the resourcing all stuff the resourcing to set up. Stuff. Oh, so for whatever reason, it's actually trying to put it into a different one. Why did it pick that one? Uh, let me see. Yeah. It's picking a wrong subscription. I can't change the subscription. That's a client subscription I can make it. You know what? Let's do this. Yeah. And then go back to it and then try the button again. Yeah, exactly. Uh, wait, all right, so hang on here. Uh, what did Moz, what's the question here? What did I miss? Something, something happened in the chat room. Oh. Time to make geek sleepover trending. I like that. <laughs> uh, and we said, what could go wrong? And Moz said, well, I could make you dye your beard. That's what could happen. Okay, do you know about the beard thing? Yeah, it's oh. awesome. It's going to be awesome. So if, so Did you know what I'm saying? It's going to be awesome? It's like going it's to gonna be awesome. going to happen? <laughs> so if we get to 5,000 followers, and I move the follower count up to the other corner there, mm -hmm. if we get to 5,000 followers by October 20, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm going to dye the old soup catcher here <laughs> rainbow color. So here's the thing, though. Uh, you can hit 5,000 followers alone. You need all the current viewers. So all you 73 that are watching us right now, you need to tell your friends so they can tell Tell your friends, friends tell your parents, friends. tell your friend, tell your family, tell your pets. Right. Go create a Twitch account and start following. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. See how many how many puppies end up following me on Twitch. <laughs> use the bot, use the bot framework to spam. No, I <laughs> hang on. I do not endorse Fudging Twitch numbers. But tell your friends to sign up for Twitch. There you go. So. <laughs> All right, let's hit. If we hit this, hey, now it says. All right, now we can sign in. Um, tell you what, let me do this. While you're signing in there, I'm actually going to change the scene so that folks don't see quite as much of what's going on there while you key That's in your fine. password. Um, uh, they can see this. This is just standard. You're okay block. there? Okay. Yeah. But, but we'll switch it to my password so they don't. They don't see how big my password is. Okay, so I'm going to go, I can go over here. No, they still are going to see it. <laughs> uh, let's go over, let's go to the starting video over here. Go ahead and set right, your thing. So there you go. That didn't refresh. There it goes. I had to open up the file where my passwords are stored on encrypted. Yeah. So I can copy paste it. Okay. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Got to, <laughs> right. Files saved right there on disk. C17 says, going to get lots of Fritz Follower 1, Fritz Follower 2, Fritz Follower 3, Fritz Follower 4. I, I get a feeling that this is uh, – now you still have the same subscription popping up there. No, I have to change the directory. So the other thing was ah. right. It was just defaulted to 1. So how Can I flip back? Yeah, we can flip back. All right, here we go. Now we can see us again. Hello, we're back. So I was going to say, so the downside of using your – my, so I have a consulting business, right? Okay. And I use my Microsoft. Um, I host stuff for some of my clients, so I have their own different subscriptions and so forth. So when I have my Microsoft account and it says logged in, it's like, hey, you have all of these subscriptions and all these <laughs> blah. Which all one? The things. And you logged in to the last one because I was doing work with a client last night. So it's just like you must obviously want this one. Yeah. It's like uh, I don't. Not not. not I'd in like this to scenario. change. Okay. Exactly. So this is this is all the things that you would normally set up if you were setting up a brand new application, Correct. right? Yep. Yeah. So I have my Lozano Tech. Uh, it's my my awesomely clever name uh, for this. I have the subscription for. I have either this is the community subscription that I get as part of the MVP. Okay. And the MSDN one is my MSDN Azure cr uh, credit that I get monthly. Right. Okay. So I'm gonna actually use that one. Okay. 
because we're going to use huge resources. Mm-hmm. No, kidding. No, we're not. <laughs> uh, we're going to create a new resource group. We're going to call this. Uh, I'm going to call it Core Wiki. Okay. Because there's no other Core Wiki resource it's groups. It's the in only that one you have. And the only one I have. So what do you want to call this? Uh, Core Wiki live stream. That works. That works. It's available. Gee, yeah. go figure. And where do you want to put this? Um, I am. I have. I have a data center, but I that I always deploy stuff to. But I'm biased. You're biased. Well, I was thinking, let's go somewhere a little bit different. I normally go to East US or West mm-hmm. US. Um, you want to know which one I would say we should go to? Sure, go ahead. Central US. Okay. And the reason why I say that is because actually Central US is about seven miles from my house. Stop it. That's cool. Okay. <laughs> like, do you, do you go driving by and go, hi, Data? Yeah, actually, on the way to the airport, you essentially go, hi, Data. <laughs> funny story. So here, we're, we're, before we go here, funny okay, story. Okay, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I was, uh, um, you know, as part of being an MVP, yeah, yeah. you get to interact with different different folks here in Microsoft. You mean people like... Scott! Exactly. And, Scott! And the other... Scott! Exactly. Okay. So the funniest thing is that I was talking with um, Scott Goop, Scott Guthrie. Yes. About this, uh, when I found out that we were going to have an Azure data center, a for a proper Azure data center, because before Microsoft had a data centers there, but they were for Xbox or 365. Okay. So it wasn't like you could deploy anything of that you could say, hey, look, it's right here. Look at the uh, yeah, yeah. sub second, you know, pings and so forth. Uh, so when I found out about it, where that, hey, that's great. Obviously, you don't know where it's going to be. Then several weeks later, and the newspaper at home, they're saying that I found out that there is a golf course in uh, West Des Moines, Iowa, that sold a bunch of land. <laughs> and it was one of my favorite golf courses <laughs> to golf at. Oh no! So they had oh, uh, no. they had 30, uh, 36 holes. Um, they now have eighteen <laughs> <laughs> because they sold a, sold a bunch of land to Microsoft, which is now the best place. To or host your data. To host the data center. Okay. So I went from hooking it <laughs> to now deploying it. Okay. <laughs> and, it's, and literally the same plot of land. Yeah. Rest so in peace, golf course. I agree, Mr. Tethys. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, along with my golf game. <laughs> along with your golf game, <laughs> evidently. Right. Yeah. Yep. So there we go. All right. So we're going to go. You want to go skew free since we don't need to do anything fancy? Yeah. Let's just. Let's just we can be free. Um, and. Uh, uh, Liam says, play golf in the data center. I don't think you'd want to hit any of that. You know hardware. what? I may get arrested before I even reach that. Uh, I actually have been thought about actually flying a drone and taking pictures of it, but I may get arrested too. Ooh, yes. <laughs> because of all the security. Things. But the, the, so, so the, the, the interesting thing about it, you know, talk about more is that, is, so it's sort of in a curve. So as you go on the road, there's a highway right next to it. And on the way to the airport, you can see pretty much the three quarters of it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It is gigantic. There are like over, I think, three football field size buildings where they have it. It looks like they're making a monster there. I mean, it's just it's huge and because of all the power that comes in and everything into it. And you see the trucks loading in the... Um, the, uh, the trailer boxes where they have all the servers because the way they do it is they load a literally a trailer a trailer box as the servers everything's configured so they load it up back into it it goes into uh, the center center they plug it in and then all the servers are there and they all just light up yes yeah so and and uh, Liam is saying Javier's MVP status being removed in three two <laughs> one no 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 we're we're <laughs> We're pretty happy with Javier. He's doing some great stuff. So, so hit next. All right, yeah, yeah. Let's do oh, the let's next. next. Let's let's deploy this thing. Let's let's make Following some. Following Mr. Johnson, so appointment. while that's going, so that. they literally replaced a golf course with a giant building that's three football fields, American football fields, so American hundred, football fields, hundred yes. yards long, three hundred yards long, and uh, which is about the same size as a a uh, international uh, football field, right? A normal soccer I think football so. field. Uh, I think so. Yeah, about the same size, and. Uh, and that's the cloud. That's one of the clouds. But it, this giant building is a cloud. A, yes. <laughs> Which is funny enough because there's the old, the old data center 
is probably two miles from there. So there's actually two at Microsoft data centers within it. Uh. So that for when they launched it, the old data center was the original Azure one as they were digging holes to <laughs> build the buildings. And then over, I think, an entire year, they switched it over to it. To another one. MVPs playing golf inside the data center is the new Chaos Monkey. No, actually, that's the next MVP summit. Uh, no, kidding. <laughs> totally kidding. Uh, soccer fields are about 130 yards long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, so yeah. about the same size. Close enough. So, all right. Uh, let's deploy the website. Hit it, man. Boom. Make the thing happen. We shall see this. Here it goes. Building and the as stuff. we do this, mind if I go to Azure? Yeah, now, all right, hang on, hang on. Or you want to wait for that? Longtime viewers of the of this channel uh -oh. know that I have terrible luck deploying to Azure. Oh, if this so works we'll... for you first time, it's totally me. It is totally me. I will I will give it, you know. At this point, I'm just pushing buttons. I know, right? Boom, it's boom, it's boom, Frank boom. knew it's how to build it right, and it, we you just got the we, magic touch. We just did something. I mean, we just kind of like, hey, you know what? Just realign that that's all we did. We did nothing. Frank gets all the props. You have a special set of skills. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. Skills I have acquired over a very long career. Very long career. Very, very long career. Can you can you tell it's been a long career? Look at all that gray. Look all at right. all the lack of gray. I know. <laughs> Two old guys <laughs> building a website. How are you doing? Um, all right. So, uh, yeah, width is a little bit different as well. You're right, Gareth. Um, all right, so you wanted to go look at something else while this is... Well, I was going to say, let me pop open at the Azure portal so we can see the resources that are okay. there for that one. See exactly what it's yeah, putting exactly. putting down out there. So, but since we already logged in, I can just be able to just portal that Azure, right? Right. And then we wait for this to load. Azure logo. If I go to resource groups, and there's CoreWiki. Okay, that looks good already. Can you zoom a little bit? Yep, give me two seconds. Let me... What, you guys can't read this? Come on. Dude. I can't read this. Okay. Just making sure I'm not, <laughs> I'm not the only one here. So, yeah, as you can see, Central U.S., it looks like it's working. It looks like it puts something there. Yep. What's the other What's the other page say? So, the other page said setting up search control. So, I'm guessing behind the scenes is still setting up the, um, the kudu. Okay. Setting so, up the content. So, if we were to come down here and select the – so, this is the app service plan. So, that's this, the machine that we're okay. carving – that we carved out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's we, right there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the power of chroma key. Um, and then we come look at deployment options. We yeah. should see here that it actually is pulling it from GitHub. Okay. All right. If, if, and, if, and if this, I went too fast, I can, we can go no, no, back no, no, and no, no, no. it again. And the, and the circle is spinning, and it's spinning because it's actually doing something. It's not an animated GIF. But if you look at the com what the, what's the comment on it? Building. No. A fixed naming change. That was the comment that I wrote. Woohoo! Okay. Stinky so it's stuff. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. All right. So we know it's pulling the last commit because they get the commit message. Right. Okay. That makes sense to me now, and and hopefully, right? This will be something that anybody will be able to stand up their own core wiki. Uh, Liam is saying, great job, now off, have a good stream. All right, thanks thanks for joining us, Liam. And, of course, um, we'll, we'll be archived and over on YouTube later. Exactly. Um, come on, naming change. This is the fun part of doing something like this, that we just kind of have to wait until it gets done. Yeah, this is the part where we just kind of sit back. What? It's done yet. <laughs> Um, and right, just wait. Another reason for good commit messages. Typo fixed, final for sure. G a good point, Mr. Tethys. <laughs> well, fixed naming change, I think that's that's not bad. That's not bad. The thing about it, you, you think about it, the commit message should also is tied to the PR, which has the conversation. So it's not necessarily the commit. I, I agree that we have to have a good commit messages so we have it. Yes. But... Because the way we have the workflow, I can go back to know specifically what the issue was behind the scenes. Yeah. So if I use something like Jira or I use something like uh, DevOps boards now, that's what it's called, or um, or even just issues on GitHub, it's all nice together. Yes. Now, uh, Frank is saying this could be long because we're using the free SKU. Now, free uh, SKU means, yeah, it's a shared resource. It's 
It's not our own dedicated machine that we're using. Oh, right. Um, and that's okay. For what we're trying to do, we're, at this point, is we're just trying to make sure that the changes, Frank, that you worked on, work, work. the way it is. The changes that we did, just to make sure that all the everything's connected, and see if we can push it out there. If yeah. this thing takes an hour, then so be it. We can do other stuff. Sure. But it's just more of like, hey, we have you ever made it this far? Me? No. Okay, no. So this, so that's a good thing. I mean, at this point, we're just winning, right? <laughs> this is all we have right now. Yeah. And who cares if it takes long? What does a minimal core wiki deployment cost? Nothing. Nothing. Because you can use the free resources yeah. and deploy for free. So let's talk about that at uh, azure.com. So, the, and this is something that we were talking, uh, not we, but a few folks were talking about yes. on the Discord server is, in order for you to get the free resources, you need to sign up and you need to, you need to give them a credit card. They're not gonna charge the credit card. You can set a spending limit literally of zero yep. oh. and it'll only do the free resources. Yep. So when I went here, I went to pricing and I look at this and then where I was, by default it says, always sets it to central US because that's I deploy all my stuff there. Yeah, and, um, and the green the green screen isn't looking too great behind us on that white background. Oh, that's but, fine. Uh, yeah. But anyway, so if you look at it here, you can deploy 10 applications, one gigabyte space, price per hour is free. You can't do anything, custom domains, anything else, because again, it's free. Yeah. There's, there's no need for you to do that. Again, we're just making sure it tests. Instance, how many cores for sharing a core? We're sharing 60 CPU minutes per day. So this is good enough for us to just see that it works. Yeah, yeah. Right, for, for what you're doing with the .NET Conf website where you're extremely output cached. Oh gosh. That, that type of, uh, I want to say almost brochureware website mm -hmm. fits that, that uh, interaction very well, right? That subscription level. Correct. For what we're doing with CoreWiki where there's going to be edits, there's going to be commits, comments uh, to articles, you're going to want something a little bit more than that, maybe basic, uh, I actually have the the full version of CoreWiki at standard. If you go to corewiki.info, you can see the the live version of the website. Uh, CoreWiki.info, and I've even got the SSL certificate installed there. Ooh. Right, you got the little padlock in the corner. Look at that. Fancy. So I installed and I use uh, Let's Encrypt. Oh, yes. To get a SSL certificate for free. Mm -hmm. And it's installed, and there's even a, a little job that runs in the background every 30 days that will reset that. Oh, very nice. Uh, is Kubernetes in the free services? I don't think AKS is in the free services. No. no some, of the, some of the larger ones uh, tend to have a little more. I'm sure they have a basic one, which is significantly cheaper. But the reason why they don't is because it requires a lot of moving parts behind the scenes. Yeah. Oh, or yeah. Because at, at the end of the day, you know, even though we talked about serverless architecture, mm -hmm, talking about mm -hmm. clouds, they're still servers. <laughs> That's the dirty secret. It's, serverless runs on servers. It's just very, very low on the, on the platform. And it's just, you assume that, that there's something there to build on top of. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, all right. How we hey, it deployed. All right, so we got a check. Sweet. Okay. Got a check box. So what's it say in the deploy to Azure panel? That tab that where we actually clicked the button earlier. Manage your website, as you can see. Browse to CoreWiki live stream Azure websites.net. Cool. Let's go there. Let's go there. And we now, it may not be the fastest, but <laughs> loading it, but it's okay. That's okay. And you're gonna need the default credentials. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna continue drinking water over here. Yeah, yeah, go. Go, go, go. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, it says you still have the administrator account. Create a new user and delete the account. Right, the ad default administrator is admin at corewiki.com, which yeah we couldn't get. And the password is is admin with a capital A at one two three. Okay. That's my password. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Invalid login. Uh, it's because I, oh, I forgot the at sign. <sighs> you, that's why. This is not the Postgres version of the database brave cover. There we go, we're logged in. So, so we're in, 
and you can change your password. We I'm not going to change it because no. then I'm going to keep it there for a while. But there's the co- default cookie policy, and things just work at this point. You can yeah. edit the home page. Uh, you should probably, right, if we were keeping this around, you should probably create a... Uh, An actual real user. A yeah, real user. Net. Yep. And stuff like this, I typically like to keep the administrator user alone and then create another user for actually the content. So that way mm-hmm. you can... One is a back office operation, the other one's not, but that's just me. Sure, right, so what I would do, to, to your point, I would create somebody who isn't def, you know, admin at CoreWiki. Create, you know, Jeff, you know, at CoreWiki, you know, and, well, I would actually want a real email address, but whatever. Yeah. And uh, set that up as the admin and then remove this, this user. Correct. So, um, and that's part of what, one of the things that we want to build, we're not gonna work on it today, but we want to build a good startup experience, right? We had this experience where you came and it's got this red bar that says, ah, you still got the default admin user. Mm -hmm. It'd be nice to allow you to configure, you know, who your default admin is so we don't have to go through who the default admin is. And as Mm -hmm. Brave Cobra is suggesting here, choose my database storage. Yep. Right now it's using SQLite. Yep. So it's funny you said that because one of the best projects that and I would say one of the best projects, one of the first projects out there that did this, especially for that was open source, was Subtext Engine, Blogging Engine. Oh, okay. Many, yeah, many yeah. Ago, I'm not sure if you, if you guys, this this goes back and dates us, I guess. Um, so Phil Hack. We love Phil. Um, who is now at GitHub yep. and worked at Microsoft. He was actually PM for ASP.NET and NDC many, many years ago. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, he was a major contributor to a... Um, a blogging engine called Subtext. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And by far, one of the things I love about Subtext, and I will do it for demoing, is how it it bootstrapped itself. So what I mean by bootstrapped is that whenever you deploy it somewhere, it didn't, it required a database, but it checked itself to say, hey, have I been configured yet? Yes. Oh, I haven't been configured, so then I have to step through the process. Similar to what WordPress does or other, uh, or other um, software out there, Websites like, hey, I know I'm here, but you haven't configured X, Y, and Z. Yeah, yeah, okay. So one of the things you could do something like that is essentially use sort of storage, you know, just writing to the file to say, hey, here's just temporary files, a deploy, you know, dot deployed or mm-hmm, deploy dot mm-hmm. lock or something like that to know that, hey, I've been configured or something. Right. There's, the, we've gone past the initial setup, and. We've actually got a, a thing that runs with the ASP.NET Core application that this is built on that does, um, right, it, it has the database seeding built into yes. it. So not only does it build out the database schema, right, the tables mm-hmm. and columns in those tables, but then some of those default data points, it, it loads into it. Injected. Like like this uh, homepage that you see here, you know, that just says this is the default homepage. Yeah. Maybe, to your point, maybe we change the default homepage to include some setup instructions. Yep. Right? So it's really easy for folks to see there. Um, I think RH Sumner here is actually touching on that a little bit. I like to create a setup page, then create a piece of middleware that redirects all pay, all requests to, to pages setup. set up. In case it hasn't been set up. And he's saying when <clears throat> when the user's count is zero, that makes great sense. Oh, that's a great, yeah, that's a great point. You haven't that. created <laughs> the default user yet, we'll go to the setup page. But how do you know what, to, oh, sorry about that, guys. Uh, we've been talking and I haven't been moving my cursor over here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, I, the reason why I do this is to conserve battery. Sure. <laughs> that's the only reason why it does we, it. We could plug in. You know. uh, I, that's, I have to get up and just, it's out, it's like three feet away. It's just things. Okay, uh, okay. <laughs> no, but so, so, so the question would be that is like, how do I know the user count? Do I have to query something? Sure. So at this point, we run into uh, we're into the chicken or the egg problem, right? So if the mm. users are stored in the database, but I need to set up the database. So right. So let's think about that. Can we yeah. go over? To, let's go back to the source code and let let's yeah. talk that through because you know what? Maybe maybe there's something we can we can kick off an issue here. And I like what R. H. Sumner is suggesting there. Maybe we can start you know start a little bit of code, put it and and maybe we put it in a branch to start that new. Um, that new startup page experience. Um, to Brave Cobra's question, what was different from our previous attempt? What we did differently, uh, our friend Frank here in the, in the chat room um, put together uh, a deployment script that actually runs 
cake and has to do that sync with Kudu so it knows exactly which files to publish and write into the deployment folder. Um, I'm not sure if I'm not sure if that if that follower is a is that a driver's license number? Is that somebody's social security number? Your password number? One one five eight one zero two five three three. Is that somebody's phone number? Maybe. If somebody comes through with eight six five three eight six seven five three zero nine Jenny as their user ID next, I'll be on to you. Um, <laughs> so. Um, so that's a little bit different. Popping in while whilst at work. Hey, rambling geek, thanks for joining us. So, oh, C sharp. C sharp. I sharp. can't see. Yeah, C sharp Fritz. Oh, I forgot a T in your last name. Sorry, you guys. The for frizzle. is done for this, so it's like I'm literally trying to see this and try to read it. Uh, okay. Uh, here we go. Fixed naming change. Yeah, that's what we pushed but, up. So here's the thing. As I was trying to look, oh, it's because you did this in dev. Yes. That's why. I'm in the master. Oh, so get check out uh, dev. Sorry about that. Get, no, you're fine. Origin dev. Yay! Content! <laughs> I was like, uh, why am I updated with master? Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's fine. Um, all right. I'm going to... I'm going to end my live share session because... We don't need it anymore, at we, least for now. We don't need it right now, and we might have you drive a little bit. Okay. Um, so so thinking this through, if you if you want to open the source code... Yep, give me two seconds. I'll do that here shortly. Right, so, and right to be clear, Javier's on a, he's on a Mac, Visual Studio Code, ASP.NET Core, it works cross-platform, works everywhere, and we just saw a little bit of, we were able to live share back and forth between my machine running uh, Visual Studio 2017 and the Mac running VS Code. That's a great idea, Frank. Let's, we should update the README file to remove the, oh, this doesn't quite work yet, uh, bit there. Oh, okay. We can add uh, that part of the commit. Sure. Okay, so if we look at the source code here, there is, um, which project is it? Because we've, we've done a lot of refactoring. There is a project called CoreWiki Data Entity Framework. Okay. And inside of here is a startup extensions CS. Uh, no, oh. Yeah, it's right here. Yeah, there you go. So startup extensions CS. Oh, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Right, so check out what's in here. We've got... Yeah, yeah. Right, so here's all the stuff up at the top that, that's doing our dependency injection capabilities. Yep. So it sets up our repository objects. If you scroll down a little bit further, there's the seed data method. I see it. And this is what's actually right going to... Um, Execute the, the addition of that. Right. You're, so you're essentially you're pulling the application DB context out of this and you're setting it up. But you hope that by the time the DB context is being set. Uh, oh, you're setting it right here at line 37. Yep. That it has all these options that are been set. Right. So this C data, when it fires, just calls context database migrate. Right. This is something right. that Entity Framework knows how to do, and it it stands up uh, uh, all the tables that we need if they don't exist or any other database changes that need to be made in that database. Mm -hmm. And right now I've got two providers configured. I have SQLite and Postgres, and there's a way that you can configure that in the database, okay. in the configuration, the configuration file. file. So we have that C data thing happening. Mm -hmm. So thinking out loud and coming back to what RH Sumner was saying, if we wanted to write a little piece of middleware, and we'll talk about middleware in a second, that just says, well, how many users are out there? We, you're right, we need to wait until after, well, we need to wait until after the repositories are set up, and then we should be able to reach into our user manager object and, and say, count of users. Yep, now, the, but the thing that we, at that point, we need to know which database we've chosen. So the question is, do we want to take it a step before that to be able to allow you to pick a database? I don't think so. You know? We might not need to because if okay. we, right, the, so 
uh, configuring dependency injection yep. with that'll set up the repositories and actually do the seed data here, mm -hmm. right? So seed data is called, uh, right, in the startup extensions mm -hmm. by the, uh, where is it? The seed data method is called, right? I'm, I'm walking it back here. Let's so that's in. called from configure database, database, which is part of configuration startup, which actually gets called, walking that back further, if you click the one reference here, mm -hmm. there this it is. is. part of the configure. So this is part of the whole chain of things that right, ASP.NET configures. Mm -hmm. When it first starts up, it runs this one time mm -hmm. to configure dependency injection um, and all the services. The middleware is the configure services method that happens a little bit lower, right? And yes. that configures pipeline. It will actually happen when the pipeline gets yeah. executed. This is actually happens when the application is starting up. Right. It executes once it's started up, and then we're so I think it, you know, going back a little bit, if we're if we're gonna write that middleware, the middleware, right, runs as part of the HTTP pipeline. Correct. On every request, here's what it does. Mm -hmm. So we've already got the database configured. We've already got dependency injection configured. We can add into configure services mm -hmm. the um, right in uh, into the configure method, right? Yep. And it's actually it's we will have to add it to both places. We have to add into the services. Yes. And we will have to add it into. So let me close it here. Um, so if we go to the page, if we go to the thing, we go to startup. We will have to add it at configure services to register the middleware along with anything else that you wanted to do. Right. And then we have to add it that the, or use the middleware. Right. So, right, and the piece that you see, let me go back, back up. The Everybody following the train of thought out there, kind of the, what we're thinking about? Doing? Yeah, we're, right, we're, we're on, we're peeling back the layers here. So there's... It's like an ogre. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody... <laughs> Come on, man. Uh, <laughs> um, Extra points if you get that reference. <laughs> sure. Uh, so we configure services, so we set up the repositories, and then configure database is down in the configure method to actually do all of the stuff. So after the database is configured and we configure authentication, right, because yep. we need to configure the user manager, then yep. we could reach into the user manager and, and put in our little piece of middleware at that point that says, okay, check to see how many users there are and mm -hmm. do this thing appropriately. Yes, yeah, so we get the role manager, we get all of that. So after all of this, we should know who that the thing is set up. At. Yeah, yeah. Um, how easy is it going to be to deploy code to change the data provider? So right now, um, right there, we just have an if statement in the middle of the, the configure database method mm -hmm. up top, the services configure database. Uh, if we jump into that, what, what, uh, Janesco is suggesting is how if we actually wanted to change this right so uh, where is it I think it's under add repositories services oh, sorry, add. Yes. no no right we got to walk the chain yep it's the first time I looked at source code so I'm Not just a looking at it it's like so here's yes, exactly here. so here on line 25 right there's this configuration oh, okay. what's the data provider now the question is I'm, I'm asking are you wondering how we are gonna set this or how we're gonna pick Postgres as compared to something else. Right. Because right now the only way to do <coughs> that is, is to change the code. Is to, to change ch the config file. Right. If and, and so what I mean by that is that if we're doing it from a deploy to Azure, yep. so if I, I, like for example, let's let's take this use case. I go to um, C sharp crit slash core wiki. Mm -hmm. I want to wiki. I want to create an instance. Right. I would go and say deploy to Azure. It will take me somewhere like we did to log in, configure yep, yep. the settings, wait until it gets this deployed. I can click on the link to take me there to that Azure website. Mm -hmm. Then what I'm assuming, and what everybody's kind of saying here, is that we will like the setup page to show up because it's brand new. Yes. And in that <coughs> setup page, I can I'll have I can have a drop down per se to select Postgres, SQLite. 
or custom? Because I should be able to go against SQL database. I'm not sure if I wanted to. Right, but now looking at the order that things are happening here, we might not be able to do that because at the point that you're showing that page, it's already scaffolded a database. Correct. So, so if for us to do something with that, we're going to have to change the the boot the way the bootstrapping works. Yeah. Or at least the bootstrapping change it to the configure database. Hey, is there a connection string available? Like in here, if this is returns null, then it should just not do anything. And then you have to write okay. the services. Services doesn't the thing behind the scenes is querying using the repository to get the data and whatever to say hey. Is the, is the repo gone? Okay, well then the repo can't connect for reasons because there's no connection, then just return empty. Then because of that, I know I have to do that. So then then we can have, like they're suggesting, a little piece of middleware that says, oh, there is no connection string. We didn't scaffold, either we didn't scaffold yeah. a database well, because, or we don't know where the database exactly, is. Exactly, because there is no connection string, we didn't scaffold and there's no database. Okay, okay. So then, right, then we can force people into kind of a setup page that says, where would you like to store Correct. your core wiki uh, assets? Yep, and then you can make it multiple ah. pages. You can have it to be, uh, uh, say, hey, okay, well, scaffold the database. Yes. So, or, or select, choose your adventure, yes. <laughs> right? Whichever data provider you want to do. Because uh, you have to provide credentials as well. And, yes. Or you can yes. just plop in a connection string, whichever way you can do it. And you can hit next. And then say, okay, now let's go and create a user. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And oh, then right. step through that process. And then step through that process. Because now you have a database. Exactly. And uh, Brave Cobra, you're, you make a very good point. The deploy to Azure process does provide a template that you can pass parameters in. So we could give you a way to specify in passing in a parameter, here's the existing database that I already have to hook up to, and then yep. save that source. Yep. For, and that works for a deploy to Azure button. If you're deploying this locally, if I want a wiki for my dev team, right, I or, can definitely run this. Or we get to a point where we have a uh, Docker container image out on hubdocker.com. Correct. You still need a way to say, when you light up that container, where's your database? Yeah, so, so essentially there there's two levels of configuration that we have to do. We have to do a level of, of configuration at deployment and which, which way, which host, quote unquote, we're going to go with. Yeah. And once we're there, okay, now how we're going to turn this thing on. Right, right. And which, I mean, which is perfectly fine. I mean, sure. It's, you know, These are all e very easily solvable. It's, a, it's, right, it's making sure that we understand the failure scenarios because we don't have that configuration yet. Correct. Yeah. And, yeah. and we've, we've made some assumptions up to this point Correct. that everything's SQLite, it's just a file on disk. Correct. Hey, just a file on disk, go figure. Huh? Huh? See how that works? Uh, it's funny. Okay. No, but um, it's funny because the same realization we did here is what made us pick a file on disk. Yeah, <laughs> right? It's so sometimes it's just simpler that way. Now, sure. Now, the thing with it, though, is the way CoreWiki is set up right now, it's pluggable enough and configurable enough that if someone wants to do a file not on this, but in a virtual, whatever, on the cloud. Or right. Download. You want to use Azure Blob Storage. Whatever you right. want. Right. I forget what they call it on AWS. Uh, S3. S3 S buckets. Oh, my gosh, yes. S3 Simple bucket. storage service. Yes. If you wanted to use an S3 bucket, we could have S3 bucket storage capabilities right. that you drop in as a different configuration option, but you still need, right, here's my configuration for my buckets that I'm going to be right. saving data into. Another crazy one, which I always wanted to play with, and since, you know, it will be actually storing all information as a gist in GitHub. I think I think going back to our friend Phil Hack, who works for GitHub, yeah. they might not be too happy with that. No, just for bootstrapping it. So that way you can create a gist that has all the con basic configuration on non delete passwords. So if I know if I'm already in GitHub and I'm going through and then deploying it and I have the credentials, I can just be able to Tell it, hey, here's the gist. You're gonna pull the config file from. Okay, okay. Because if you think about it, my instance of core. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Where, this is what happens. Uh, my instance of core wiki is different than your instance, so I should be able to yes. pull it from wherever. Again, just absolutely. Tonight. Yeah. Okay. So, what do you say we just take a few steps and uh, because we've got about a half hour here, yep. um, and let's take let's talk about and. 
look at what building that little piece of middleware is going to look like because I don't think we've spent time writing custom middleware here on stream. Okay. So um, first, middleware in ASP.NET Core, right? These are the various things that you set up in the request pipeline, right? So a request comes into ASP.NET mm -hmm. and it has these various pieces of middleware. Folks in Node.js are familiar with this. Right, these are the various things that are examining what came in on the request, right. deciding if there's an action they need to take on it, going and doing something, and then passing control to the next, thing. the the next command, the next piece of middleware in the chain. Right. And as you can see at the bottom of the configure method that we have over in the startup. Oh, I'll get there in a second. Yeah. yeah. There you go. So at the, right, the configure method here is actually where we did all of our middleware, and we pushed things out into other methods because we started seeing our our which is this is the right got huge. Yep. So the last thing that you see is this terminating piece of middleware. Use MVC, right? It's right. terminating because nothing's happening after it. Present, render what that user interface is, and send it out. Mm -hmm. So uh, you need more than half an hour to get this coded up. Yes, we do. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say. It's, but the thing, we can talk about it at, we, a, right. at a high level. Yes. And that's probably, we can, we, you know what we should do? So since, you know, you mentioned this, is it, we should talk about it kind of how it is. And then after, you know, after we finish the conference and so forth, we can do another session where we do code all this up. Sure. And get everybody understanding. I mean, not necessarily all of these, including the middleware, how we set those up things. So that way you give me time to look at the source code. Sure. Look yeah, at yeah. all the different pieces on it, and we can go that way. But how yeah. does that sound? Uh, everybody and put it in the chat. To be fair, right? I mean, we, I just grabbed Javier yesterday and said, hey, you want to <laughs> take a look at this thing with me tomorrow on stream? Oh, sure. What? No, and the, and the reason why I say it is because one of the things we could do is actually develop the feature. Right? And that's just right. just started with the code and saying, hey, you know what? It would be great if, if we can do it with CoreWiki, have it do X, Y, and Z. Yep. With this setup. Okay, great. Now, not necessarily that we're going to do it, we can tackle one of that, or at mm -hmm. least the foundation of it, and then now we can give a commit that and give it back to you guys so you can complete. Sure. So it's completely right. interactive rather it, than just... Right. We do, a li we do a little bit. We get it started. We, we get something happening. And we then plummet. If, if somebody <laughs> wants to pick up and, and contribute, they can certainly do that. And um, and their name will appear on the on the scoreboard, the ticker up top. And uh, I need to clean up I have some of those projects we haven't touched on in a little bit here. There's one that we haven't we only worked on like once or twice. But um, here you go. You can see the core wiki oh, top see, committers yeah. coming on. So no commitments this week. No commits this week. But you'll see on the month there's Smab with seven commits, and there's Chris Jones with three. Uh, Spoutier, Dev Lead. Ashley Broughton with a couple of them. Frank should appear there mm -hmm. with a couple changes as well. Let me force a reload on that. Uh, just because I want to make sure Frank gets his... His credit? Credit. Yeah. And thank you again, Frank, for making that available to everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's gonna make, that makes it real easy for folks to try it. And as we build new features, they'll become available and easy for folks to use. Correct. Um, there it goes. So, all right. Um, what do you say I can, you set up a live share so I can connect in and see where you are and we can contribute and pair program here a little bit okay. while, we're, while we're going. So the share button is down there. Yep, I'm gonna start a collaboration session. So. Copy invite link and I'm gonna send it to you now. Getting the Skype, there it is. And yes, I'm picking an app. Uh, no, no, wait a sec. Hang on. What I like to do is I like to actually copy the link because I've got oh, a Visual Studio and then open. You just open it and then, yeah. I didn't do that. I just clicked on the link and then open up any instance, which is was fine because we're just doing something like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. So, and then I'll join collaboration and I'm in. I think the link needs to be longer. I know, it's right? Just me. I mean, it's just, I mean, we got all these characters. Might as well just, what's an extra thousand more? There's plenty of space. <laughs> all right, there we go. I am connecting, configuring. Yep. And now, I can see here. right, I mean, to be fair, we're pair programming right next to each other, but this works great also when I've had folks, you know, that I'm connecting to across the country, yep. across the continent. We did, I did pair programming with, uh, with John Skeet across to, to the UK, you oh, know, awesome. it real easy to use and get folks yep. collaborating. And, and obviously, obviously, you know, because uh, you and I were talking about this last night uh, over dinner, 
that um, I, I manage a remote team. So we have eight develop well nine eight developers because I really don't count as one for multiple reasons. <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm, I'm leading them, yeah, yeah. right? I'm, I'm dealing with other stuff so they can be productive. Uh, and we're all remote. And right now, the way we do that is that we do it via Teams just because it's a tool that's available. From okay. The contract that we're working other with. folks might use Slack. Exactly, and whatever, or, yep. or, or Skype, whatever mm-hmm. you want. Um, but one of the things that we do is more often than not than just kind of I call you because then I can have a camera and I can have the audio. And I can just request control. So I can say, hey, let me give me your cursor. Okay. And let me help you with X. And the reason why we do that is because some of the configuration we have to do may be at the machine level. Hey, let's configure IIS. Or let's, oh, we're running, a, why is this NuGet package not being, so I need to go actually into a Windows instance. So it's, yeah. it's more than Visual Studio. <clears throat> but if it's just code, this works wonderfully for that. Yeah, absolutely. Now. Middleware, thinking mm-hmm. out loud, middleware is something that you that you configure at the website, right? You can, yes. Now, and and one of the things that we've been thinking about, and you you can see in the structure of what we have here, we've broken okay, things out yep. so that we we don't just have a website. We also have an application that has the some of the CQRS objects sitting inside Perfect. of it, so we can do query and command handling for this type of interaction. I. Is it, right, if this is something that's going to run as a piece of middleware, does it fire a command to create that initial user? Yes, it does. It fires a command to check if they are users. It fires a query to sorry, check sorry, if they are users. Sorry, it fires a query to find out if yes, yes. But I've already got my user manager available to me inside of the middleware. Right, so I would just be able to inject the user manager at that point. Right, I don't, fetch it. I don't need... A query object and a, no, and a query not. handler. I can no. just do user you're manager. You're using it at this okay. point. Yeah, and, and and that's a big that's a big thing here with middleware or anything you do. You got to step away and say, what components do I already have available for me to use? Sure. Because there's no point of creating an entire pipeline and going from the ground up on it. You can say, hey, if I already have a user manager and it's newed up and set up the way I expect it to by the time right. I use the middleware, because the middleware will happen as a request. Yes. Then I'm all set. So, right, and that one of the things we, we've been saying is, you know, somewhere out in the future is th- there's the idea of a mobile application. Yep. And if we're building a mobile application, well, everything that happens on the website doesn't happen on the mobile application. Correct. So we can't rely on things that happen inside the web user interface happening in that. So that's another thing that uh, we need to separate this. But when you're first setting up, when you're doing initial configuration, I think it's acceptable for us to say, Yes, let's <clears throat> yes. let's make this part of the setup process because it's the web is the primary. Right, interface. because I'm assuming that the web app, sorry, the mobile application, you're going to connect to an instance of Core Wiki. You're going to connect. Yes. Right. So, for example, is or like, to a, to an application instance. Uh, so, so that, that's what I mean. So, like, say for example, I I have a Core Wiki, uh, like for example here. Uh, we had it. You said it was Core Wiki. I'm going to come back to your question in a second, Brief Cobra. Right. We have Core Wiki that info. Yes. I, the whole purpose of this, and I'll make it larger for everybody to see, um, is for the mobile app, right, to connect to this instance. Yes. Well, by that point, I should have configured, I've already gone through the middleware. Right. Because so it's completely <clears throat> justifiable to us just keep that inside the web. Right. So at this point, the the web is the primary user interface. Correct. And And we don't have a facility to configure the application separate from the website. If there was that ability, then yes, we should we should have this type of interaction where you configure the application. Mm-hmm. But because the application is tightly coupled to the website, hey, there we go, some of our Channel 9 friends are here. <laughs> we, we're, I think we're okay to put this in the website. In the future, though, we may migrate that to Correct. the application when we do introduce other user interfaces. And that is a pull request. And that's a pull request. Mm-hmm. Right, that'll be just moving it. Correct. But uh, so, Brave Cobra, I, I think you're right. Um, it what was the question? So the the question was about was uh, we're assuming right now that the back end is running on the same host instance as the website, the application server, and it, it's not even that. I think we're okay with um, I think we're okay with the uh, the application and the website 
running on separate instances. If they were running on separate machines, you still need to go to one of those machines to do the configuration. Correct. Um, it's just right now we're supporting they're all on the same machine. Mm -hmm. We're using Mediator, so Mediator does let us eventually put it on two separate machines. When that happens, then we can talk about right. changing but, things. But, like. but User Manager no, does know how to use our user manager does know how to interact with our user database, so we're okay there. Yeah, so th that's the thing about it too. The user manager and those and the kind of infrastructure is bolted in to actually be used to have a live connection to do these things. So I view more of a user manager sort of things as just necessary infrastructure for it to work. Uh, it doesn't make it the only thing, but that's just kind of how it's set up. Cool. Um, all right. So, so we're, those are those are the assumptions we're making right now. We're taking a little bit of Yagni, a little bit of you, oh yeah, you aren't going to need it. it. These are all assumptions. <laughs> yes, you know, um, because we we ha don't have the we don't have the facility to split these up yet. Right. That'll be coming, but the even if you do, you know, if, if the standard setup is that things are all running locally and on the same uh, same host instance together. This will still be a supported scenario that we'll want. Correct. Yep. It's when you want to set up and say, okay, I want that giant core wiki instance that's running on multiple web servers, uh, you know, across instances, and I've got a central application that's running only in one location, mm -hmm. and my data stores are all over the place. When you're at that magnitude of mm -hmm. setting up, yeah, then we're going to need to move things around. We're probably going to have to do a lot of refactoring and how we're going to do the, um, the setup and you know and those sort of things behind the scenes. Uh, you kind of get into more of a similar to a build server, right? Yeah. If you think about a build server, the build server you have the configuration of how you want the build, and then you have the agents. Okay. So the yeah, yeah. Agent will then phones home and says, "Hey, what's my configuration for this type of build that you told me to execute?" Boom, gets it, and then it goes about its way. Right, so and it registers so that the build server then says, oh, I've got an agent out here Correct. that I'm going to send the build over to. Yep, so if we're doing this, if, if that's the end goal is to use, um, again, the pattern, then a lot more things will have to evolve. Absolutely, along with the thing. and yeah. we'll learn about those as we build them. Exactly. Cool, exactly. so let's talk about building this middleware. So middleware goes into the website. So right now, if we look at the website project, mm -hmm. We have a bunch of different folders here for configuration, globalization, helpers, pages. We don't have a middleware folder because we haven't built any middleware there has, yet. Yeah, there hasn't been any. So um, let's create a middleware folder so we can put a class in there. What? Actually, you know what? Let's start off even simpler. Let's just write anonymous middleware, right? Ooh. And then, right, then we'll scale up and, and do the other things, right? Yes, Octopus does do that. that, that that's another great example. Oh, yes. Yep. So, um, I'm going to go into the startup. I love the name of Tentacles. By far, that's that's just like taking the theme, like high praise. <laughs> that's what that is. <laughs> so we're both here in the startup file. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me go to startup file. Uh, I see your cursor there. I had it there and I closed it. So because I thought you said we went to folder. So yeah. I'm, uh, sorry, I'm picky when it like I close things just because okay. I like to only folk squirrel. So <laughs> I like to keep things Easy focused. distractions, yes. All right, so um, hello, Death Packs. Welcome. And uh, we just had another new follower. Is that Kim Papa? Thanks for the follow. Hey, we, we gained two more followers since last time I looked up. So 3645. Yeah, I think it was 3643 when we were talking about You can that. count. <laughs> there we go. Frank's on the scoreboard Crazy now. math there skills. That's right. Click crazy mad math skills. <laughs> So um, when we're building the pipeline, right? Mm -hmm. So I think we want to put it like here before we configure the status pages. Yep. So now the, the important thing to notice about, um, so how many, raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> well, that's actually what Deathpacks was doing there, raising their hands. And how many of you out there uh, uh, understand that middleware is significantly different than an HTTP module, like in, in ASP.NET framework? Um, and the reason why I say that is because a module, you register to events on this thing. Yes. So there's the page load, there's the application start, and so forth. So you're saying, hey, on, run these bits of code when this thing fires up. Sure, when this event happens. When this event happens, which is great because you can opt into these only specific things. But middleware, the reason why I bring this up is because people view middleware as like, oh, it's just a module. It's like, eh, it's not. 
It's mm-hmm, mm-hmm. same, same, different, but different. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that middleware, you're essentially you're saying, I'm here, I am execute something, I'm gonna give control to something else, and when the request comes back, I'm gonna continue on the next event. Yep. So it's more of like, a, hold on, pause. <laughs> mm-hmm. I can continue. So you have to be smart when you write these things. And it's, and my main smart is like, oh, I don't want to put some of that logic outside of it. It's related, It's sort of procedural asynchronous yeah. <laughs> logic that you have to write. So, so, right, just stepping in at this point. Yep. Yeah. We, we have, I have a hard stop because we have to do another .NET Conf tech check in about oh, 15 minutes. That's fine. So let's just do a quick thing right here. So... Um, Go ahead and type, and I, I can. Sure, sure. Can do it since so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a app dot uh, not. So there's right three different things that you can call for middleware, right? You can say app dot run, and it'll pass over to a delegate. Yep. So essentially, when you do app dot run, you're just saying, hey, this piece of I'm injecting this inside all the middleware, and middleware is hierarchical. So that means that if I put this. This middleware will execute after I do all of the uh, telemetry, exception, security headers, uh, authentication. So it's going to get executed down here. Now, if you want it, believe it or not, if you want this to be executed before authentication, you just yoink, <laughs> move mm-hmm. that line before the, ad- the authentication happens. Absolutely, because the order of events is literally top to bottom right. in here. So that's app run. I'm going to do an app use. Ooh because I want to pass information about the context along yes. as well. And this all happens asynchronously. So it's an, it, I'm getting a, a pause. There we go. I'm gonna do an, it's an async delegate that right. you pass along and it passes the context and then the task, right? The next the thing next, that it's gonna the do. The next thing it's gonna execute. And for some reason. Man, VS Code is just. This is Visual Studio. Oh, it's Visual Studio. Hmm, I wonder what it's doing. I don't know where. So yeah, so it's interesting. So we're doing a live share. I'm sharing it this and VS Code, and he on his uh, Lenovo is has full fledged Visual Studio running. Yeah. I, I thought you had it open, but no, I I, I was looking at the wrong icon. Yeah, <laughs> it's. I'm locked at this point. Oh wow! Yeah. I'm like. It's all locked in Windows, or just that one since. Yeah, this is toast. This instance of Visual Studio is fried. Nice. Right. Uh, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to jump over to Visual Studio Code as well. That's fine. Because I can. And I'll jump right back into that same shared instance. Sure. Uh, Come on. Jeff Fritz has disconnected. Really? You there think? are eight callers in this conference. <laughs> <laughs> yes, middleware is always async. Yes, yes. Yep. Uh, right. The reason why it's always async is because you want to uh, have the execution, wait for it to come back, and then the the the, the handle of the thread picks up where you were last executed, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which is totally different than a module because a module you get nudged to do something when an event happens. Um, didn't he just say it's executed in the order that it's entered, that it's presented? Yes. That it's configured. And here, like, if I were, if we were to put, right now we have line 54, and if we were to move that above uh, line 48, that's when it gets executed. So we will, if we try to get users, and we're having um, configure them, we have the user manager, and I move the line up there, I can't get that data because it hasn't been configured. Um, our friend, uh, where is it? I just saw it there. That blow dart says, Uh-oh. I love that configure localization has been spelled correctly. Yes, we have an international <laughs> team assisting with the, uh, with the project here. And uh, yeah, we, I think we know who that blow dart is. It's not the blow dart, it's that blow dart. Okay. I see how this works. All right, I am going to, where is it? I need to join. Mm-hmm. Join collaboration session. There it is. And we're getting pinged since it's eight forty-eight Redmond time, and yeah. we have meetings for .NET Com. Yeah. So that's why we're like constantly like, oh, okay, looking at this, looking at that, because we're reaching that point where we got to go make the donuts. Got to go make the donuts. donuts. Absolutely. The dot nuts. Is that dot even, nuts. Is that a thing? Is that even a thing? I just found them. I just kind of. No, it don't there. go there, dude. Um, <laughs> right. Um, I'm gonna do that. That do it again. That just requires <laughs> <laughs> requires two of them. Two of those. 
No, it's it, actually your your borderline. And you blow it. Yeah. So, all right. So we're gonna do an async here. We need to receive. I don't actually. I'm gonna receive the context, mm -hmm. and then whatever the next task is. Correct. And then I'm going to fat arrow into some sort of an anonymous method here where I'm going to go do something, right? We can just do context that we can just do write it, you know, just write something to the pot to HTML for now, you know, or add a header or whatever, you know, something. sure. So at least people understand that hey, we're in the middle of this, we're injecting something in there. Sure, uh, I think Node.js folks invented this pattern. Says my nine eight seven. The concept of a of a pipeline. Uh, it's been around for it's been around for a while. Yeah, Node.js uses it very nicely, um, but it's I don't think they invented it so much. Node.js needs to use it mm. <laughs> because mm. the way it's actually uh, the execution of the JavaScript because you have the engine there's single thread, so it needs to pause and continue these things. Um, so, so and that Blowdart says someone already had Blowdart. Damn them! Oh, so it is our our friend Blowdart. So I'm going to uh, just come in here. I want to I want to get the current set of users. I want to check and see if there are any users. Um, I'm in user manager. It's either going to be I don't want to I don't want to get oh, roles. I th get users in a role. I could say get users in a role and see if there's any admin users. Yep. So it's so one as you're doing this. Like the one thing to notice here, guys, it's in line 56. When it's user manager, I was scrolling over here. He, as you, that's being injected into the method as one of the parameters. Mm -hmm. So when we're doing actually an anonymous uh, delegate, we're actually wrapping that context of that external variable and allowing it to be passed into this anonymous uh, delegate. It's going to execute a totally different timeline yep. when the variable was actually initiated, if that makes sense. So imagine if it's kind of like a, like a pretty wrapper mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where we put this thing, it makes it safe. And so when we pass it to the delegate, the delegate says, like, oh, let me pull that out. And it's all wrapped for you by the runtime. Oh, yeah. You could do this in uh, the, old, uh, the old way, and you would just be spending an entire day writing all the plumbing to make it all work. Oh, yeah. And thread safe. So it's, we're very lucky to be able to have this sort of pipeline available for us. Really smart people have figured this out and made it super, super simple, which is really, really difficult, for, as you, I'm sure you guys know. Oh, yeah. Uh, easy things are not <laughs> sometimes the easiest to do. Um, so, yeah. All right, so this is where we're going to say uh, no admin users are available. Uh, need to route to uh, database, no, to uh, initial user setup page. Correct. Yep. And then we can just do a straight redirect at that point. Right. But for, for right now, right, we, and that redirect would be context dot response dot redirect, and then we would go to something like, you setup. know, right, setup now, slash, you know, uh, uh, database admin. Correct. Something. Now, the one thing we have to do this is that we just introduce an infinite loop. Go ahead, tell me, why is that an infinite loop? The reason why it's an infinite loop is because we have middleware executed here. Remember, everything's done under request. Mm -hmm. So as we have line 56 in here, uh, and we check, hey, are there no administrators configured? Great. Go to slash setup slash database admin. That thread terminates. Mm -hmm. The thread mm -hmm. that, that picks up and says, hey, I need to do a slash setup slash database admin says, hey, are there any users here? No, you need to go to redirect to slash setup administrative access. So you're spinning, you're essentially a redirecting yourself every single time because we have to absolutely no way to check that we're in that specific context. So what RH Summer is saying then, oh, well, we got to do HTTP context, request path starts with, new path string, Correct. set up, yep, exactly. and then we can break out. Correct. So and, and the only reason I'm bringing it up, not necessarily that, oh, this is just, those are the sort of things you have to be careful mm -hmm. or think about when you write middleware. Doesn't mean you shouldn't write any middleware. It's like, oh, that's too complicated. It's like, no, no you've no, got to no. step away and saying, okay, once I execute, what stuff do I, what is the context that I am in right now and some of the assumptions that I have to make for me to actually continue the execution? Oh, yeah. Starts with segments and it is, right, a uh, new path string. Yep. I would just do slash setup. Uh, And uh, 
All right, starts with segments will return a Boolean. Yeah, so why isn't it like that? Path string cannot be found. Yeah. Um, what am I missing here? Starts with seg segments, path string, other. Yeah, why am I not getting the because you're not referencing it. I just reference it for you. Thank you. you re it, re right. it requires ASP.NET.HTTP. So now I can say if is in setup and, uh, no, it needs to be if, if not, not in, setup. in setup and the count is zero, redirect into the setup location. Yep. Or you can say it's in setup, then return it. Right. Now, so sh automatically short circuit it at line 58. Yep. And, uh, oh, we could do map when. Map when would be good as well. Mm -hmm. So instead of you doing use, the good catch there uh, is that Niam, Niam York. Mm -hmm. Right? If I do map when, right, this is another way, right? We can say, well, go check this. And if it's, if this context is true, go do something. Go do this. Um, where is it? And the, uh, yeah, so there's the funk predicate, and then there's the action that you want to take on that. Mm -hmm. uh, so the funk predicate could be just context set requests, because what is the funk predicate would get, get injected in there? Right, um, so if it's async, right, if we do context, er, right, it's context and then a Boolean, right? What's the action? What's the test? Well, that test is that this, and it's actually the reverse of it. It's a not that. Right. So if we did that and flip this, but hang on, I'm thinking this through. I'm not. I don't have this syntax right. Let me look at the map. It's func HTTP context, and it returns a bool, right? Mm -hmm. So I have this backwards, right? It's context. And that, get rid of this. So, uh, yeah, it's the, it's, the con it's the funk to figure out what it is. Right, right. And then, is there any performance difference between the two approaches? No. They're pretty much doing the same thing. They're essentially, it's like, hey, I'm only going to execute when this predicate actually happens. So, yep. the map when actually injects middleware <laughs> to say, hey, I need to now check the, the request as it goes through, then if that's the case, then continue with this other other delay. Right, so I'm, I'm passing in a context, I'm returning a Boolean, so I would do the test. Yep, then when you do a comma. So I would, right, I would do the test and then return the action to redirect. I like the other way better, because I'm doing Come on, keep backing You're up. Looking for the syntax. I always look at references. Map when console, so that's the test, comma, then the func. Ah, uh, okay. So hang on. So let's go back to that. So map when, and then it's the the test. Mm -hmm. um, right, context, blah 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 blah. Forward slash. Well, yep. uh, there'll be context forwards, so you gotta pass in the context in there. Gotta do a that fat there arrow. You go. Yep, and then do comma. Let me make sure instead of this comma. And then now we can pass in left parentheses context comma next. Uh, async con. Uh, yes, sorry. Async. Context next, and then fat arrow into this. Now what am I missing? Why am I getting red? Let me see here. Uh, oh well, it it's in. Action of I application builder. It's not taking in a context. Oh, that's well. Then they had application builder, so I wasn't quite sure that was something that they they threw in. There. Oh, then oh, it says app dot build run. Okay, hang on. Right. So this needs to be its app that gets passed in, and then it would be app dot run. Not no. Yeah, app dot run, and then it's uh, the context. Async Spell context. context. Async context. Ooh, fat so arrow. Disconnected. <gasps> I got disconnected. Which means all of my code is gone. <laughs> we can do it over here. So if we if we do up, oh, I guess. We do a new line here. Um, oh, you. This guy hasn't done. 
it downloaded a new version of LiveShare in the middle of that. Oh, you probably have it set up. We can do that, so we have App Builder. And we can do uh, App Builder that run. And now we can do um, something. Right, now we can pass context. You don't need to pass next, because we know that the scenario is we're, we're redirecting out. And then left we can, brace. Yeah, we can get rid of this guy because we don't need that anymore. Uh, let's see where. Are yep, that if statement goes away, and it's just. Uh, oh no, that if statement's good. Why aren't you not liking this? Uh, I don't call pass return a value. Oh, it's because yeah, we're not doing anything here. Um, we can just say return. Nope. What what return is it waiting for here? There we go. There's the if statement. Oh, that's inside the if. That's why. Don't you still need to invoke next? No, because we decided. Uh, in in this case, we're we've decided that we're exiting out at this point. Um, should, I think you need to. I think they are right, though, that you need to pass next, next in. Yep. We can do that. Um, Let me see. Uh, don't we have that await? Parts get issued. Uh, you may security middleware or other that acts after this. Um, well, right. In in other pieces of middleware, that that may be true. In our case, we're jumping out. We're um, we're actually exiting the loop at this point. I don't code pass return value in the lambda expression. That's not really. Let me get reconnected to you. Oh. I was dumb. I forgot yeah, the async forgot keyword. The async. I'm like, whenever the request like it's like, oh duh, it's because it's not I didn't mark it as async. Sorry guys. <laughs> I'm like <laughs> do, 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 do. So now we could create a setup folder and put something in there that does Correct. database admin. Um, I'm attempting to rejoin the session. Yep. There we you go. Should be joining me so what I'm gonna do just to give us a page, I'm just gonna create a, a file under dub dub root. Uh, I'm going to create a folder. Let's start there. Let's create a folder called setup, just so there's something there, so we can show that this works. Um, setup, and I'll create a uh, another new folder called what was it? Database admin. I cleaned up some of the code. Thank you. Easy. And I'll put another file there, and we'll call it uh, index.html. No, it'll, we need default HTML. Oh, yeah. for setup? Yeah. So we just so there's something here, mm -hmm. right? So HTML. Say body. We made it. We won. And we managed to keep everybody on the stream. That's amazing. Even as we were going there and fumbling with uh, some code. Uh, you need to set up a new admin user. Just That's something good. so it Perfect. Totally content. That's so good. let's comment out. Uh, in core wiki data let's go to C default admin user and where it says if admin any users and it goes to create the user on 43 through 47 oh no let's just make this false just to force this to not create where did you do that this is click uh, click the little people thing there it'll jump right oh, to sorry. me click on me there we go and scroll down, and you'll see where I am. Perfect. There you go. So all I did was say, you know what, user result. F uh, it's there's a succeeded thing here. Um, <laughs> no. Let me get rid of that. And let's just comment this bit out so that it doesn't create the user. Mm -hmm. Okay. It just defines it, but fails. Uh, how are you going to stop someone going to set up directly and starting to configure things? So. That's a very interesting point mm -hmm. from the blow dart. 
um, not any old blow dart, that blow dart, um, th there's another piece of uh, middleware that we'll put in that says, if there are users created, don't go and do these things. Correct. So it'll block yeah. you being able to get in there. Yeah, well, right now, the way we're, we're sort of have it set up is more of like, hey, here's introducing the concept of middleware, how those things are. Like, like we said earlier, it's like this thing needs to be a little more matured out of all the different perspectives and then implement that. Yeah, but, it, you're, but, but it's, you're right, blow it, it's, a, it's a great thought that you know, we would hit as we continued through the process. And you're right. like two steps ahead of us here. You're doing it in a page so I can get that page on my own. Right, so right now it's a page. At some, at some point it'll be a razor page and we'll put authorization. Yeah, at this point we're just trying to figure out, hey, is Spruce Goose Does it go apply? there? <laughs> Does the middleware work? Mm -hmm. So why don't you go ahead and, and uh, do a .NET run on the project and let's see if, right, or even a debug start yeah, from here. Yeah, we can just do a debug start. And let's see if it works. And it shouldn't create the user and we should get routed right through. Uh, Bill, there was an error, which one? Uh, you need to do a NPM install. Oh, okay, NPM install. Go to bash. Everybody loves the bash. And then we'll drop off, what the, we'll, we'll sign off, we'll commit this, and then we will uh, end the stream there. Okay, start debugging. Did you, did it NPM install? Yeah, it said nothing, there was nothing install. Update available. Okay. I'm going to do that, the update, for NPM. I don't, mm, shouldn't need it. No, you're like a major version off, dude. Yeah, you need it. Okay. NPM, uh, G, NPM. Uh, oh, NPM. Oh, there we are. Now as we download the entire internet. I know, okay, right? Because NPM. Installing NPM. I mean, look at it. I know. It's hey, it was done. All right. No npm install. Let's see. And it Boom. should and pick it should up. Uh, no, so oh no no. Uh, I think you're on the root. You need to go down into the core wiki project. Oh, on my. You need to step down I one. Did, uh... There you go. Now npm install. And you'll find it. There we go. Yeah yeah. One package. Just make sure there's perfect. And now .NET run there. Or .NET watch. Sure. And... Give it a sec. It's thinking up really hard. It's doing all the restores. It's doing all the .NETting. Uh, yep, that's fine. La la la. La la la. Come on. And the reason why it, we were able to do that in a run is because it automatically knew it was in the project and it was able to do a CS project. If I were to do it high level, I have to say project slash CS project. So if we try going to localhost 8081. Mm -hmm. Come on. Oh, come on. Do the thing. There we go. Mm -hmm. And it'll route you to the SSL version, not secure. Now, it didn't give you the the other the other page. You must have a user, or an admin user, and it even didn't give you the admin user is already created. Mm -hmm. That's so let's weird. So let's figure it out. We'll put a we'll debug it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, All we'll right. Put it, a breakpoint in here. Oh, sorry, it's there. Um, right there, and we'll just go to debug start. Just so that we can see where I see where it is. Map when is request path starts with segments. You need to turn that to a not. Oh, gotcha. That's why. Trues and falses. Mm-hmm. We'll just start terminal, new terminal. Uh, how much my path? Oh. Secret a new one, sorry. No worries. Command run. Oh, we gotta wait. It's over here. There it is. Look at that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nuke the de databases. No, we're not there yet. Oh. That's that's fine. Coming. That's fine. 
What, uh, what it did blow Oh, it's up. because uh, we have... You have it running in the other terminal. The other terminal. Um, close that. Where's the terminal at? Terminal. Uh, control. Right, command tilde. Yeah, I had it open, but the problem is I already had it. I had it over here. I need to get rid of it. It opens up a new tab every time. So you <laughs> notice that? I have it over here. So it's There it is. It's already running. So control C. So we just And then just rerun it. Ignore. Exactly. I just need to go over here yeah. and let it run. Sorry, guys. I created a new, <laughs> a, a new tab inside of it. To me, I had a couple I, of them going. Well, the thing is, I don't like that it's a drop down for tabs. Oh, or yeah. new instance, but that's just all right. So we should be able to go back to that same browser and do a refresh. Uh, nope, that's not one. Oh, no, local no. host yeah, yeah. right? Yep, there you go. HP need oh, it's because the object has been disposed, and this guy. Here's what's going on. Here's this is. We ran into this before, and this is. This is a crazy little thing that we, we saw previously. So it's an async thing that's calling into user manager. User manager gets disposed of mm -hmm. during this process. So you can't actually run it asynchronously. You have to run it synchronously? You have to run it synchronously. So hmm. instead, of, instead of making this an async call into the context, so if you flip back over to it, yep. right? By, I can't get rid of that because it's it's async. Now we're kind of in a in a weird loop here where I'm trying to interact with the user manager, but it's been disposed of. Correct. Uh, we may have to pull it out of the container. I mean, out of the services again, because we can always get a new instance that's been actually. Right. Used. Right. So we can do that. Um, and we're in the app in the app builder, mm -hmm. so we could. Oh man! Now we got right. We got to chase this around a little bit. Now we're over the time. We are over time. So let's do this. We know this isn't quite working properly. Mm -hmm. Let's put this into a feature branch. Okay. And and we can come back and work on this more later. Um, did you fork my repository when you no, built this? No, I was you doing it locally. Doing clone locally. Um, Which is fine. I can fork it and I can put this over there. Yeah, and, and then and we'll we'll push that up and we'll we'll take a look at it uh, a little bit later. Yep. One of the things we can do is I can once I pork it and I have that on my repo, I can give it to you so people want to take a look at it. Yes. More than welcome to, and then we can so, bring it back. And then um, I think Bloatart has some interesting insight there as well as to how to secure this so that when you are starting, not when you're after start it up, nobody can jump in and fire the setup stuff. Correct. So. Yep. Very cool. All right. I think we learned we learned a lot. We thought th we thought through a lot of yep. different things here. I'm going to play the intro music to play us out here, um, and uh, let me turn that down just a smidge. So way too far. <laughs> so we learned a lot. We we yep. thought through a lot of things here. We've got some interesting real world scenarios that we've yep. built on, and we're bringing into Core Wiki that are going to make this really good. Correct. Frank helped us out and we got the Deploy to Azure button working, so that's that's really cool. Anybody now can deploy their own version of Core Wiki out to, out to Azure. And we tested that and that works great. And it works great. So thanks so much everybody for joining us. Yep. We've got some work to do to finish getting ready for .NET Conf. Thank you very much for navigating mm -hmm. there. 23 you, hours. 23 hours, yes. It's 23 hours from right now it starts. Uh, I hope you tune in and join us at .NET Conf .com. .net. .net. Uh. .com. Dot com. Oh, man. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. I hope you join us. It's going to be amazing. All righty? Thanks so much, everybody. Take care.